Distillation towers are designed in a variety of ways to meet the demands of particular applications. A distillation tower, or column, can be categorized by the number of products that leave the tower. Two common types of towers that are identified this way are binary towers and multi-draw towers. A binary tower separates a feed into two products. For this reason, you may also hear a binary tower referred to as a two-product tower. Some binary towers separate one light component from a range of heavier components, but they are still considered to be binary towers because only two products leave the tower. Multi-draw towers separate a feed into more than two products. A product that leaves a multi-draw tower is referred to as a draw or a stream. Multi-draw towers are also referred to as side-draw towers because some of the products or draws are taken from the side of the tower. For example, one type of multi-draw tower has three draws, one at the top, one at the bottom, and one near the middle. Because a draw or cut is taken out of the middle of this tower, this type of tower is sometimes referred to as a heart-cut tower. Multi-draw towers can also have more than three draws to separate several products from a feed. This one is an atmospheric tower in a crude oil distillation unit. An atmospheric tower is so named because distillation takes place in it at or near atmospheric pressure. Now that we've established the difference between binary towers and multi-draw towers, let's focus on the operation of a typical multi-draw or side-draw tower. The multi-draw tower illustrated here is used to separate a mixture into four products. Each product may be made up of one or more substances. The tower has four draw-off lines located at different levels. The draw-off lines provide a means for removing the products of the distillation. We'll number the products one through four to identify them. The illustration also shows two devices called strippers or side stream strippers. A condenser, a receiver, and a reboiler. Cooling water reaches the condenser through this line. Steam reaches the strippers through these two lines and steam reaches the reboiler through this line. After the feed mixture is preheated and introduced into the tower, the heaviest components move down the tower, while the lighter components vaporize and move up the tower. The temperature at each draw-off point is important for the proper separation of the products. For example, the temperature is the highest at the bottom of the tower, where product one is drawn off. Here, the temperature is hot enough to vaporize the components that become products 2, 3, and 4, but it is controlled to minimize the amount of product 1 that vaporizes. If we move up the tower to the area where product 2 is drawn off, the temperature is lower than it is at the bottom of the tower. While there may be some overlap of products in this area, the concentration of product 2 is highest in the liquid that is drawn off at this point. If conditions in the tower are controlled properly, the concentration of each product is highest at its respective draw-off point. Let's take a moment to see how draw-off is collected. The liquid in each tray in the tower collects to the height of a weir, which is a dam-like barrier that holds the liquid on the tray at a specific level. If the tray is at a draw-off point, a portion of the liquid is drawn off through a draw-off line. The liquid overflow from each tray is allowed to flow to lower trays through passages called downcomers. This liquid is called internal reflux. This arrangement helps to ensure that any heavier components of the liquid have a chance to travel down to their proper draw-off points. The liquid that is drawn off by each side draw line goes to a side draw stripper. Each stripper is basically a small distillation tower. Its function is to remove or strip off any lighter products from the liquid. Liquid from the tower enters at the side of the stripper. In the stripper, the liquid is heated by steam, which causes any lighter products in the liquid to vaporize. The vapors that are produced are reintroduced into the tower above the tray from which the original liquid was drawn off. The liquid that is left over in the bottom of the stripper is drawn off as a product. The products or cuts obtained from the distillation process are sometimes called fractions. For this reason, distillation towers are sometimes called fractionating towers or fractionators. The physical dimensions of distillation towers may be different. In general, they are most affected by three main factors, the relative volatility of the feed components, the feed rate, and vapor loading. 
Relative volatility is the relationship between the boiling points of the feed components. Feed components that have a low relative volatility are difficult to separate because their boiling points are close to each other. In order to effectively separate the components of a feed with a low relative volatility, a tower requires a large number of trays, and in order to accommodate those trays, the tower must be fairly tall. The second factor that affects the physical dimensions of a tower is feed rate. Basically, higher feed rates require towers that are larger in diameter. The third factor that affects the dimensions of a tower is vapor loading. Vapor loading refers to the total volume of vapors generated by the reboiler, and the vapors produced as a feed enters the tower's flash zone. The flash zone is the section of the tower where the feed enters and some of it vaporizes. Higher rates of vapor loading generally require a larger diameter tower. Lower rates of vapor loading can be handled in a tower with a smaller diameter. Some distillation towers operate at a low pressure. In these towers, a tremendous volume of vapors may be produced, so the diameter of the tower must be large to handle the vapor volume. Since a lower volume of vapors will be produced in a distillation tower that operates at a high pressure, the diameter of the tower can be relatively small. Another way a tower may vary is in its function. For example, the function of one type of tower is to separate or split components in one boiling range from components in another boiling range. This type of tower can be called a binary tower, a two-product tower, or a splitter tower. For some product specifications, it's necessary to separate light components to control the product's initial boiling point. To meet these specifications, some processes use distillation towers called stabilizers. Another type of tower is called a stripper tower because it strips lighter components out of the products. However, unlike most other distillation systems, a typical stripper tower system does not condense the overhead product into a liquid. Instead, the overhead product remains as a vapor and is sent for further processing. Some towers are named according to the chemical product that is being separated. For example, a tower that separates propane and lighter components from a feed can be called a depropanizer. The overhead product from a depropanizer contains mostly propane and some lighter components. Components that are heavier than propane end up in the bottoms product. Many distillation towers operate at or near atmospheric pressure. There are some distillation towers, however, that are designed to operate at pressures lower than atmospheric. These types of towers are called vacuum towers. Vacuum tower operation is based on the fact that pressure affects the boiling temperature of a liquid. For example, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at standard atmospheric pressure which is 14.7 pounds per square inch, or PSI, at sea level. If pressure is decreased to 6 PSI, water boils at 170 degrees Fahrenheit. When the pressure inside a tower is reduced, liquids are vaporized at lower temperatures. This process is referred to as vacuum distillation. Now, keep in mind that a vacuum tower does not operate under a perfect vacuum. Vacuum distillation simply means that the pressure in the tower is lower than atmospheric pressure. Vacuum distillation is used for several reasons. First, one or more components in some liquid mixtures may decompose or be damaged at high temperatures. If such a mixture is distilled at high temperatures, an unwanted product may result. A second reason for using vacuum distillation is that running a tower at high temperatures requires more energy or fuel. Operating a tower at lower pressures allows the distillation process to be accomplished at lower temperatures, which requires less energy. A third reason for using vacuum distillation is that a tower that's designed to operate under vacuum, and therefore at a lower temperature, can be constructed of materials that do not have to be specially made for high temperature operation. Structurally, there are two basic differences between a vacuum tower and a tower that operates at atmospheric pressure. We can use this illustration of a vacuum tower system to see what the differences are. For example, a vacuum tower is usually larger in diameter than an atmospheric tower, and the trays are farther apart. These differences are necessary because a vacuum tower generally produces a larger volume of vapors than an atmospheric tower. Another difference is that a vacuum tower has an additional system that creates and maintains a partial vacuum in the tower. 
The partial vacuum is maintained by either steam jet ejectors or a vacuum pump. These components draw gases out of the tower through the condenser. Azeotropic distillation is a process that is sometimes used with mixtures whose components are difficult to separate. Essentially, an azeotropic mixture behaves as if it were a pure material. The vapor produced by boiling an azeotropic mixture contains the same percentages of components as the original mixture. Even if more heat is applied and all of the mixture vaporizes, the vapor composition remains the same. One way to separate an azeotropic mixture is to use a solvent. The solvent is a substance that, when combined with the azeotropic mixture, allows the separation of components to take place. Another way to separate an azeotropic mixture is to use two distillation towers in a special arrangement. In this topic, we looked at different types of towers commonly used in distillation systems. We also looked at some factors that can affect the physical dimensions of a distillation tower. In addition, we looked at a vacuum distillation and azeotropic distillation. Now try some practice questions that relate to this material. Multi-draw towers separate a feed into more than two products. A product that leaves a multi-draw tower is referred to as a draw or a stream. Multi-draw towers are also referred to as side-draw towers because some of the products or draws are taken from the side of the tower. For example, one type of multi-draw tower has three draws, one at the top, one at the bottom, and one near the middle. Because a draw or cut is taken out of the middle of this tower, this type of tower is sometimes referred to as a heart-cut tower. Multi-draw towers can also have more than three draws to separate several products from a feed. The physical dimensions of distillation towers may be different. In general, they are most affected by three main factors, the relative volatility of the feed components, the feed rate, and vapor loading. When the pressure inside a tower is reduced, liquids are vaporized at lower temperatures. This process is referred to as vacuum distillation. Now, keep in mind that a vacuum tower does not operate under a perfect vacuum. Vacuum distillation simply means that the pressure in the tower is lower than atmospheric pressure. One way to separate an azeotropic mixture is to use a solvent. The solvent is a substance that, when combined with the azeotropic mixture, allows the separation of components to take place.